expected uh, Dr. Jyoti Rakshmi Vadasili, Dean um, School of Postgraduate Studies, senior faculty members of the uh, Department of Anthropology, junior friends and student friends. Good evening to everyone. I am very happy to introduce Dr. Jyoti Rakshmi Vadasili, the external examiner of uh, Mr. Ranjit and the scientist five of uh, NAPG, National Institute of Plant Genome Research, one of the autonomous institutes of DBT. And uh, I would like to give a small introduction, although people uh, knew about her. Uh, she is uh, hailing from Kerala, and she did her uh, UG program from Kerala Agriculture University between uh, 1998 and 2002. Later, MSc in Genetics from Indian Agricultural Research Institute, New Delhi. Then, PhD from Germany. Postgraduate uh, PDF uh, from both USA and Germany. Later on, in 2014, she joined an APGR. Now, she is heading EMBO Global Investigator uh, Program up to 2024. For her credit, she has received many awards and fellowships of nine, including fellowships and awards. And currently, she is guiding uh, six PhD and six PDF students. Although uh, she is a plant breeding and genetic person, currently she is working on microbes and insect elicited or mediated difference and the behavior of insect as well as the plant during this interaction. With this brief introduction, now I request Dr. Jyoti Lakshmi, who is going to uh, talk about uh, symbiotic fungi, pyrifarmospora indica, balances basal immunity and recruits host derived metabolites for colonization. Dr. Jyoti Lakshmi, please. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, can you see my slides? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, yeah, okay. <clears throat> uh, so I'm Jyoti, as um, Dr. Kale Selvi introduced me, and it's my absolute pleasure to be an external, uh, you know, um, examiner for um, Ranjit. And I'm sorry that I couldn't come physically um, because of a lot of uh, conflicting schedules, but I promise to come one day to your uh, university. TNAU is very dear to me and one of the premier institutes uh, of our agriculture. So I'll um, begin my talk just to introduce you first to my research interest before I go into the specific topic that I'll be speaking today. Do let me know if you get if you're not able to hear or there is some problem with the slides, please do let me know. So my uh, lab works on two major research themes. One is in the plant insect interaction. Just a moment. I'll just take a pointer. Mm -hmm. So uh, one of the topic is plant insect interaction. We work on Spodoptera litura and also on Frugiperda as well. And we try to understand uh, how does the plant perceive insect herbivory very rapidly. And why is it important to understand why um, plants perceive in insect herbivory rapidly is because herbivory is a very fast process. Unlike plant microbe interaction, which uh, goes on for many days till, uh, till, till, you know, till you see a result. In the case of plant insect interaction, the chewing, uh, you know, the mechanism of chewing is so fast that the plants have to respond much more rapidly to herbivory uh, than with any other stresses. So in this, we, of course, study the usual culprits in this pathway. We know that jasmonic acid and multiple metabolites are involved. But my lab is trying to understand what is happening upstream of the jasmonate pathway, what is activated before this jasmonate pathway, which leads to you know, the downstream responses. So we are basically working on calcium channels, which are activated within minutes after, uh, you know, herbivore interacts with the plant. And what is the molecular mechanism underlying this plant immunity? Yeah. Other than that, uh, we are also looking at the insect side and looking, are there insect derived signals or effectors 
uh, that can down regulate the plant defense because since it's a you know plants and herbivores uh, in uh, are co evolving with each other like plants have an immune response like that insects can also stop this immunity and uh, use that system to you know like as you've heard for fungal effectors uh, we try to look if insects releases some proteins that can stop this uh, immune response uh, so uh, in herbivory part this is the major th things that we are looking at and for the fungal mm, symbiosis we we again uh, this is a i'll tell you in detail what the system is but essentially there also we i'm looking at the early uh, what what helps a plant recognize a symbiont and a pathogen what are those early signaling pathways which are calcium mediated which acts in the symbiotic interaction and also identification of metabolites which are involved in the symbiotic process under the broad field of chemical ecology yeah. so today's talk um, the title would be the life inside plant roots how symbiotic fungi piriformo spora indica balances uh, immunity mm -hmm. and recruits host derived metabolites for colonization so to go in detail um, before we go in detail i'll just give you a brief outline of the microbes that we are working with we are working with the good microbes essentially as you have also heard in ranjit's talk where he was looking for also these uh, you know good microbes which help the plant in uh, getting induced systemic resistance in his case so we are looking at these microbial superheroes which are um, on the plant roots and these symbiotic microorganisms are intimate allies of plants you have already studied that are vascular mycorrhizal fungi associate with 80% of land plants and they they increase the root surface area due to this colonization and uh, also with nodulation the plants acquire a significant proportion of their nutrient requirements through such mutualistic interactions yeah so these are the good microbes which help the plant and you've mostly heard of am symbiosis and for about nodulation which happens in uh, pulses however this talk is on a, uh, another um, you know um, microbial uh, you know in um, symbiont which is called piriformo spora indica the new name of it is serendipita indica it is a, a fungus belonging to the order sebaciinales and it is a mutualistic root uh, endosymbiont so what does this fungus do if you can look here in the picture so this is a arabidopsis plant control and this is a plant which has been inoculated with the fungi and as you can see apart from you know enhancing the nutrient uptake it also increases the plant growth you can see this in arabidopsis in tobacco in multiple chinese cabbage a multiple host it has no absolute no host specificity whatever plant we have tested so far it has promoted growth so the uh, fungus can colonize only the roots uh, and it has a wide host range so who discovered this fungus actually the p indica was discovered originally from the root microbiome of a woody shrub in the indian thar desert by professor ajit verma from jnu when he was there many years ago and over the time it has become a absolutely great model system to study symbiosis in model plant arabidopsis and why is it because most of the symbiotic interaction like am fungi or uh, no nodulating bacteria you know that they cannot infect arabidopsis so you know none of the basic studies has been done with arabidopsis with such symbiotic organisms but p indica is very special in that it can it can colonize uh, arabidopsis and hence it's a very good model system multiple papers over the year have worked on this uh, uh, symbiotic fungi i myself did my phd in germany on on this uh, uh, fungi the new name of it is serendipita indica so it got its name uh, original name piriformo spora from pear shaped spores so you can see here the uh, the spores are in the shape of uh, pear shaped and these fungus is also special in that you can also grow it axinically there are um, most of the you know i like am fungus or other ones they need a root uh, also to grow but here you can grow this axinically and it, it uh, hence it makes it easier to use it as a model system uh the question is why does p indica promote plant growth uh, we we just saw the pictures that they really make the plants bigger 
So there are two mechanisms by which uh, the fungi can promote plant growth and which we know in the case of uh, PIRI or I call it P indica by the short form PIRI, you know, all through the talk. So uh, please excuse me if I use it, you know, um, differently. So uh, P indica promote uh, plant growth by enhanced nutrient uptake. We know that, for example, in this cartoon, this is a plant cell and what you see in the gray is the fungal hyphae. Okay, so you, we know that P indica contains multiple uh, nutrient transporters. So, for example, multiple labs have studied that P indica contains phosphate transporter, which is called the PIPT, which in turn helps to transport phosphate from soil uh, to give to the roots. It also has magnesium transporter, or sulfur transporters. These are all very well characterized. So one of the way by which they promote plant growth is by increasing the nutrient uptake via enhanced uptake of phosphate, magnesium, sulfur, etc. The other also nitrate. So the other way that they alter uh, plant growth is via altering the growth hormones. Okay, this part is what I'm going to tell you today, but it is well known that they alter auxine and cytokinin levels in plant roots and they themselves also secrete growth hormones in axonic cultures. So uh, using these two mechanisms, they are able to promote plant growth. Now the question is where in the, where in the roots, uh, you know, they colonize. When we study such a symbiotic interaction, it is always imperative that we ask very, you know, the, the devil is in the details. So you really have to ask these fine questions, which part of the root. So if you divide the roots into three parts, this is the meristematic zone, uh, the, and then you have the elongation zone and the maturation zone one and two. So multiple studies have shown that P PIRI usually colonizes in the maturation zone, as you can see with this green color here in the root hairs uh, and the, in, inside the roots, it only uh, grows in epidermis and cortical cells. Okay, It doesn't enter the root endodermis and vasculature. So it leaves this place uncolonized. It only colonizes on the outside, Okay, only in the epidermis and cortex. They cannot enter the vasculature. So if we, uh, for example, in this picture, we have a GFP label PIRI and you can see that they uh, form these hyphal structures on outside. Like arbescular mycorrhiza, if you've heard, why does it have that name? Is because it forms these arbescules inside the cells. So in the case of uh, P, P indica, we don't see any such arbescules. It's just hypha growing on outside and reaching up to the cortex. That's it. So if you have uh, read more about the uh, arbescular mycorrhizal, you know, pathway and the nodulation pathway, uh, uh, you would know that it has a common signaling, uh, you know, what is called as a common symbiotic genes, which are shared by both the pathways. So uh, the, the nodulation releases the knot factor and the AM mycorrhiza releases what is known as the MIC factor, which is perceived by our plant receptor which in turn activates multiple channels and leads to calcium elevations, which are sensed by these calcium sensors and, le and leads to activation of specific transcription factor, which either leads to nodulation or mycorrhization. Now, these genes are common in both the process and these are called the common symbiotic genes. Now, with case of PIRI, none of these common symbiotic genes are involved in the interaction with Arabidopsis or other plants, and they are uh, occurring independent of this common symbiotic genes. So, uh, once uh, once we know that this this is happening, multiple labs have tried to look up uh, what what are those signaling pathway which is happening when PP indica is colonizing the roots of uh, its host. So, in this case, this is Arabidopsis. Okay. Uh, so if you imagine this is P. indica colonizing on the roots of Arabidopsis, you can see the spores germinating. There would be multiple elicitors which are being sensed. We still don't know what are those receptors which sense these elicitors. However, we know from our study in 2020, uh, published in Journal of Experimental Botany, that this calcium channel CNGC19 is very critical. Uh, for for uh, influx of calcium inside the plant, and this is very critical for a controlled colonization. So uh, essentially, this paper tells us that plant defense is also a very critical component in mutualistic interaction. When you think of mutualistic interaction, you usually would think that the roots, you know, 
uh, can recognize a good and bad fungi and maybe when there is a good fungi or bacteria they do not activate much of a defense pathway however we found that this is not the case uh, when you even have a symbiotic fungi the plants do activate basal immunity and this is uh, mediated via this mam triggered immunity which in involves callose deposition indole glucosinolate accumulation and jasmonic acid so if you block this pathway via uh, if you block the cngc19 this whole pathway is shut down and now the plants are not able to recognize cng uh, the the p indica as uh, you know as any any either symbiont or whatever it it, it is not defending against this uh, microbe if such a thing happens then we have over colonization by the fungi and instead of promoting growth it inhibits growth so what it tells us is that it cngc19 is an important gatekeeper and that plant immunity is also a critical component in symbiotic interactions i'll explain in detail um, you know um, um, in plant microbe interactions which are beneficial plant immunity is a crucial determinant for control colonization of any symbiotic interaction for this is with p indica that i'm showing so mutually like pathogens are confronted with an effective innate immune system in the root cells and the mam triggered immunity restricts the growth also of the symbionts yeah so they make they make sure that the symbionts are growing in a uh, only in a controlled manner which is beneficial for the plants so if this control is lost they grow un uh, they grow too much and they no longer remain a symbiont and how do the plants do at least in the case of uh, piriformospora indica they do this using a plant derived secondary metabolite called indole glucosinolate to restrict the propagation into specific cell types so this is a fairly recent paper where, where different uh, pathogens and p, p indica is in the green you can see serendipita indica the green one and they have measured by single cell um, sequencing method they have done a transcriptome of each cell layer that is epidermis endodermis vasculature they have isolated each cell layer and looked up at the transcriptome and they found that the indole glucosinolate levels are very high in the endodermis and vasculature and that is why uh, our p indica is not able to go beyond beyond this uh, you know epidermis and cortex and that is how plant is maintaining this controlled colonization now what will happen if there these genes involved in indole glucosinolate pathway are mutated or we have a loss of function mutants so the loss of function mutant of genes involved in the indole glucosinolate biosynthesis there are two genes the cyp79 b2 and b3 the double mutant and the mib51 so these mutants have no growth promotion and in fact they exhibit a growth inhibition about p indica colonization as you see with the cngc19 as well which is upstream of it so if you don't have mam triggered immunity you have um, uncontrolled colonization and growth inhibition so the colonization success also depends on ev uh, evolution of strategies for immunosuppression there can also be other strategies by which uh, you know plants and fungus restrict each other's growth there can be also multiple fungal effectors which are involved in the process now um, if we look uh, upon this uh, interactions upon multiple plant roots and microbes and look at the chemical communication which is happening between plant roots and beneficial microbes we can categorize them into three three categories that they are uh, there are plant metabolite signals in the very early colonization or recognition that is before even the uh, hyphae you know uh, makes a contact with the plant roots we know that flavonoids are secreted uh, from the roots of uh, plants which act as a chemo attractant for rhizobial bacteria we know that strigolactones initiate branching from the plant initiate branching in amf so these are these plant metabolite signal involved in very early co uh, colonization or recognition now there are also uh, microbe derived uh, small molecules which are present in this interaction for example uh, i've told you before about the mic factor and the not factor which is secreted by the am fungi and uh, nodulating bacteria so these are essentially lipokaito oligosaccharides you might have studied them p indica also releases a small molecule called cellotriose which helps it to be recognized by the plant there are also yeah 
uh, once again, you will uh, face non visible now. Can you uh, change your position of your camera, please? Can you? Oh uh, no, this is in my desktop. Can you see me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 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 Uh, so uh, the plant metabolites facilitating. Can you see? Me? So the plant metabolites facilitating active colonization. I've already told you with Arabidopsis that there are indole glucosinolates which are involved in this interaction, which mediates plant immunity. Yeah, they can help to keep the immune response kind of uh, keep the P indica colonization in check. However, we do not know of any metabolites involved in growth promotion pathway. So why is it that the plant is, you know, getting growth promoted? So we don't know much about the metabolites involved in this pathway. And hence we decided to look at those plant metabolites facilitating colonization and growth promotion. As these specific metabolites responsible for P indica mediated growth promotion were unknown. So we decided to use tomato, which is a plant with lot of metabolites. Essentially, if you just take a tomato leaf and rub it in your hands itself, you can uh, get a sense of uh, the level of uh, metabolites and volatiles in them. So we use tomato as a host for P. indica growth promotion response and to know the metabolites involved in the process. So before we could use a tomato, we had to establish a system where we use P. indica and show that it has growth promotion because all our previous work has been done with Arabidopsis. So with tomato, we started inoculating. This is the non-inoculated plants, and this is the P. indica inoculated plant, same age of the plant. And uh, we try to inoculate it for different days. So the DPI is uh, the 10 DPI, 30 DPI, and 40 DPI. So um, after the inoculation at 10 DPI, you don't see any shoot or root growth weight enhancement. So PI inoculated is the, these plants. So at 10 DPI, we don't see any difference. At 30 dpi, we start to see that the plant is getting bigger, both the shoot and also the root. And at 40 dpi, we see maximum growth promotion of both shoot and the roots. Okay. We also used a GFP labeled um, uh, Piriformospora indica to look at the hyphae and spores growing on the surface of the roots to tell us that it was an endophyte. Once we had this data, we also looked up at the roots because piri is a root colonizing fungus and you can see here that the p indica colonized roots are really huge yeah this is without any transgenic method so they are really huge roots so what we did next is we quantified the amount of fungal dna in the roots after colonization so using a real time pcr and a fungal specific uh, primer so we quantified the amount of fungal dna that is p indica dna in the roots and we found that like the growth promotion is increasing at 40 dpi, the amount of fungal colonization is also increasing up to 40 dpi. Okay. And we hence we decided to use this time point, the 40 dpi, for all our uh, assays further because this was a stage where we saw maximum growth promotion and maximum fungal colonization. Yeah. Now we didn't know what metabolites to look for. So we did an untargeted metabolomic analysis upon P. indica colonization using GCMS. Um, and uh, we took root samples, uh, uh, control and treated with P. indica. We also took the shoots um, samples and we also had mycelia, pure culture of mycelia to eliminate uh, any other metabolites coming from the mycelia. We only wanted to have plant specific metabolites. So hence to minus it out, we also took out mycelia. So if you have worked with uh, untargeted metabolomic data, you know that you will get multiple mass signals in such a data. And uh, many of them we, we could annotate. For example, in leaf, we annotated 50, in the root 70, and mycelia many more, much more because it's an axonic culture. So now we also categorize there are many metabolites which are common between leaf and root, common between all three as well. So as you know, um, uh, what we found is that P. indica colonization alters both, of course, leaf and root metabolites. And since this is a GCMS, the annotated metabolites covered a broad range of mainly primary metabolites, including sugars and amino acid and few secondary metabolites. So uh, then we started looking up. First, we looked up at these common guys, which are between root and leaf regulated. We wanted to see, uh, you know, how are they behaving, the common ones. So surprisingly, we found that, <clears throat> so this is the root data. You see the red guys are upregulated in the roots. And you can see that the same, um, you know, they behave in a negative manner. So in the leaf, they are 
decreased if they are increased in the roots and if they are decreased in the roots they are inc increased in the shoots so they seem to be negatively correlated at least the common ones between leaf metabolome and the root metabolome changes so there is also crosstalk happening with the leaf uh, with the upper part of the plant which is uh, happening negatively but p indica is essentially a root uh, you know root colonizing fungi and hence we specifically decided to look at only those root specific metabolites so if you you know finding a specific metabolite from this large data set is like finding a needle in a haystack so you have to do a lot of statistical analysis and multivariate statistics pca vip score plot analysis multiple analysis we done we did uh, to find uh, the major metabolites which we can say with confidence that yeah this is the metabolite which is most induced when this colonization is happening and one of the major metabolite we found was fruit raising uh, if we also have a, a volcano plot of the log p uh, p value and the fold change fruit raising is the highest up regulated root specific metabolite not shared with uh, leaf uh, which is induced in the system so we further decided to look up at pet fruit raising because this seems to be the most important metabolite in this data now what is fruit raising Putrazine is a polyamine. It's a low molecular weight molecule, as you can see here. Very simple structure. It is derived from the decarboxylation of amino acids, often from arginine. Uh, so um, this was how we found in the GCMS. So this is the tomato root, and this is the mycelia. Yeah. So we didn't get any uh, putrazine in the mycelia. However, putrazine is the primary metabolite. There should be also very less amount of putrazine. Uh, in the mycelia as well so we decided to also you know do develop a method on lcms by which we can quantify this putrazine more efficiently and uh, properly so uh, using lcms we measured the levels of putrazine also in the roots and we found that it is enhanced in the tomato roots as you can see very high level of putrazine whereas in mycelia it is negligible but there is a small peaks yeah here at least with the lcms you can detect something yeah but it's essentially a, 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 a root specific metabolite here this was done using lcms ms based absolute quantification now uh, once we got this data we went back to the literature and asked is the role of putrazine biosynthesis known in other beneficial plant microbe interactions the, has it been reported so we know that in rice at least in 2019 it was reported that plant growth promoting rhizobacteria increase the accumulation of conjugated putrazine that is picomyral putrazine and ferroyl putrazine it is also new, known that accumulation of comyral putrazine and ferroyl putrazine is uh, known in barley mycorrhization so there are multiple reports of it being induced uh, we know that the genomes of plant associated bacteria also contain putrazine uptake genes and pseudomonas fluorescens mutant that cannot produce putrazine is impaired in its ability to colonize arabidopsis thaliana so there are multiple reports which tells us that putrazine seems to be important for microbes to form you know beneficial interaction so the, we ask these following questions how is putrazine beneficial in our system to the host and microbe how does it promote plant growth and what are the genes involved in the pathway these are the major questions we asked um you see the metabolites being up and down um doesn't have much of a significance unless you can prove genetically that if you do not have this you know by knocking out their biosynthetic gene and proving that you do if you don't have this metabolite something happens to that system so without functional characterization just having metabolite up and down doesn't um, have much of a physiological significance so that is what we wanted to uh, you know uh, ask in the third and last question so we'll come to the first question why is the root producing putrazine is it beneficial to host and the microbe so we are first asked is it beneficial if to the microbe if the root is producing lot of putrazine so what we did we uh, tested a co uh, um, different concentrations of putrazine on the growth of uh, p indica in its uh, you know axonic culture either on the plates or in uh, uh, liquid cultures and we tested different concentrations and what we found here was that at a concentration of 10 micromolar which is very less um, you see a increased p indica radial growth you can see in this picture as well if you inoculate in the plates uh, in the axonic culture you can see that 
the radial growth of P indica is increased if you add putrazine 10 micromolar to the plate. After that, it gets saturated. It doesn't increase beyond that point, even if you dump it with putrazine 100 micromolar, doesn't make sense. So it, at the low concentration itself, it is able to in, increase the growth of P indica, both on the plates and also in the fresh biomass. You can see increased the P indica. So this tells us that this metabolite seems to be good for the fungi to grow. So uh, we again went back to the literature and we know that polyamines have a role in fungal cell differentiation and development. We know from multiple reports that tutrazine is involved in regulating hyphal growth of uh, AM fungi glomus mosse due to endogenous concentration of co this compound in spores being a growth limiting factor. So there were such reports which tells us that tutrazine is also beneficial to other AM fungi. So this gave us a lot of hope that, uh, okay, the P indica at least seems to be, uh, it seems to be good for the uh, microbe if the roots have a lot of putrazine. Then we looked up at the other question, what happens in the host? You know, what happens in tomato plant? What uh, if you have this 10 micromolar or a little bit higher of putrazine, does it help tomato? So the answer is yes, you can see the control and this uh, low concentration of putrazine. So we can see that the plant growth is also enhanced both the shoot and the root fresh weight just by adding putrazine. Uh, this is what you see here, putrazine. We also tested another metabolite. If you remember my, you know, untargeted metabolite analysis, there were multiple metabolites which were on the, putrazine was the first which was highly induced. There was gluconase A which was a second most induced metabolite. So we also checked that and we didn't find any growth promotion response with gluconase A. We found that it's very specific only to putrazine. Yeah. So with these two data, we know that it is uh, this metabolite is, uh, you know, in, uh, good for both the microbe and also the plant per se. Now we asked ourselves, why, why do you be, see a bigger plant when you add this low amount of putrazine? What does this activate? So to answer that question, we again looked up at what we know. We know that oxygen biosynthesis is very critical for symbiotic interaction of P indica with roots. We know that the signals from P indica activate oxygen re responsive reporter genes in Arabidopsis roots. Uh, so these are oxygen reporters, DR5 uh, tomato reporter. And this is P indica colonization for different time points. So you can see the nice red color here of the reporter. So it gets activated in three hours. And at 24 hours, you can see very good color. So uh, oxygen pathway is activated pretty early upon this interaction and in the roots and cytokinin as well in the shoot. So oxygen and cytokinin are major growth hormones in plant growth response against P indica in diverse plants. We also know the effect of GA from some other reports. So it uh, P indica interferes with oxygen production and signaling in host uh, to contribute to root growth. Multiple papers have shown this. And we know also that the polyamine interacts with hormones to regulate growth and development. So this all this um, literature helped us to ask the next question. What happens in the plant when you treat putrazine? Are these growth hormones in any way affected? And this is what we, um, um, you know, measured. So we developed a method on LCMS. So growth hormones are very, very low abundant in plants. And the extraction of uh, growth hormones from plant is a very tricky process. <clears throat> so we we had uh, in our metabolomics facility, we developed a huge array of methods that you can use to quantify cytokinins, all the forms of GA and IA. So uh, once we had this method ready, we measured them in control and putrazine treated conditions. And as you can see uh, that the IA levels are increased upon putrazine treatment. The GA4 and the 7 levels are also increased upon this putrazine treatment, not any other GA, just these two forms. And surprisingly, uh, this is only the root da um, uh, data, so cytokinins were not uh, much uh, affected in this. So essentially, putrazine induces growth promotion in tomato by elevating the growth hormones, IA and GA in this case. Now, um, once we knew that this is the process by which they promote plant growth, we wanted to know what are the genes involved in this process and whether we can, you know, target these genes, knock them down and, you know, get, uh, see what is the impact of them. Now, as I told you, putrazine biosynthesis occurs from two precursors. They can either be made from arginine or they can be made from ornithine. Yeah, either through arginine decarboxylase pathway 
or through the ornithine decarboxylase pathway. In tomato, there are two genes in the arginine decarboxylase pathway and three genes in the ornithine decarboxylase pathway. So we looked up at the expression of all of them um, at under multiple time points um, upon P indica treatment. And as you can see here, it is mostly the SLADC1, which is highly in, uh, upregulated when you treat it with the fungus. And none of the other genes are significantly upregulated using a real time PCR. So we then we, we understood that in tomato, the putrazine biosynthesis upon P indica colonization happens through this arginine decarboxylase mediated pathway and specifically through the SLADC1. Okay. So once we had this gene in hand, we decided to do a functional analysis. So what is functional analysis? I knock down this gene and look what happens to the symbiotic interaction. Yeah. <clears throat> so then we devised a method by which we can knock out this SLADC1. We did it using Vix in Pusa Ruby variety. So uh, we inoculate the Vix constructs in the leaf and the P indica is, uh, you know, uh, added into this uh, in the soil mixture. So we had three set of plants that we tested, an empty vector <clears throat> and the SLADC1 silencing construct. SLADC1 silencing construct followed by P indica spore suspension. So uh, all this treatment, we looked up at how, you know, uh, what is the silencing efficiency because we are essentially using roots here and we are having our, you know, big construct in the leaf. So we had to make sure that in the roots, the SLADC1 is really silenced. We looked up at multiple time points, 7, 14, 13, 40 dpi. You can see that in the SLADC1 Wix plant, they are essentially downregulated, telling us that our system is at least working. We measured also the putrazine levels in these um, Wix lines and we found also that they have less putrazine. So the Wix is, uh, you know, really uh, working. And now we asked ourselves, what will happen in, if you knock out this SLADC1 or if the plant is not able to produce putrazine, what will happen to that interaction when you inoculate with P indica? Okay. So this is how the tomato plant looks, wild type plus PI. That is just normal growth promotion. This is an empty vector control as well. And this is what happens when you do not have this ADC1 or that the plant is not producing putrazine. So you can see very clearly here that the plant doesn't promote growth at all upon P indica colonization when it doesn't have putrazine or when you knock out this knock down this ADC1. So this is what we quantified wild type, wild type plus P indica. You can see a both shoot and a root growth promotion, empty vector and empty vector plus PI just to take into effect the wicks, um, you know, and a control. You also see a growth promotion in empty vector plus PI. And this is SLADC1 wicks, which cannot produce putrazine. And when we co-inoculate with P indica. So you can see when this happens, there is absolutely no growth promotion. Yeah, both in the shoot and the root. Now we asked ourselves why why is it that it is not promoting growth? You know, I've told you in Arabidopsis that sometimes when fungus overgrows, it can have, you know, lack of growth promotion. Or maybe in this case, putrazine is good for the fungi. So what if the, you know, the fungi doesn't grow very well if there is no putrazine? So we had to test what is happening in the roots. So I've told you before that we are quantifying the colonization of the fungi by real-time PCR. And we did this upon wild type. This is wild type plus PI. You can see that the amount of fungal DNA is increased. This is in the empty vector plus PI, also high amount. But in the SLADC1 Wix PI plant, we can see that there is hardly any fungal colonization. So that is what also you see here. This is the empty vector, the control, and here in SLADC1, very less fungal colonization. So putrazine seems to be beneficial to colonize efficiently in the roots because it's uh, essentially good for the fungi for its own growth to have putrazine as i've already shown you before yeah now we asked is this pathway conserved in other host of p indica so uh, there are multiple host of p indica we wanted to test in arabidopsis as well if if this pathway is conserved so uh, we also found that arabidopsis also if you add this very small concentration of putrazine it increases its growth uh, we um, ordered multiple tDNA knockout lines of Arabidopsis. So there are two genes in Arabidopsis involved in the ADC pathway, the ADC1 and the 2. 
So we had knockout lines, complete knockout of these genes, ADC 1-3. These are lines that you can order from there. Uh, and, um, uh, and you can, you know, use the homozygous lines uh, we made. And we use this for all our assay where all these genes are knocked out individually. ADC 1, this is in one gene, the ADC 1 gene, we had two tDNA lines. And the ADC 2 genes, we had also independent two tDNA lines. Now, when we looked up at the fungal uh, amount in this after colonization of P. indica, this is wild type plant plus P. indica. We are at, the, uh, at a specific time point, we are looking in wild type, there is a lot of colonization. Whereas in both the ADC1 and 2 mutants, um, mutants, we see that there is decreased colonization by PIRI like we saw with, in tomato. So if there is no putrazine biosynthesis, we are seeing decreased colonization. So we also looked up what happens to the growth promotion response in Arabidopsis. So uh, uh, this graph, uh, the y-axis is the Arabidopsis fresh weight. And these are all the lines that we have used. The wild type, the ADC mutants in the first gene, ADC1, there are uh, three mutants. And in the ADC2 there are a gene, there are two mutants here. So this is the green bar is the control. Now in wild type, when you inoculate with P. indica, you can see that the Arabidopsis fresh weight is increased. Yeah. When you complement it with putrazine or you add more, put, uh, you have putrazine also in the media or you add putrazine during the experiment, you can see that it doesn't enhance beyond a point. It's not that if you add putrazine externally uh, over a P. indica colonizing plant, normal wild type plant, you don't get an uh, enhancement over the base level. However, in the ADC mutants, which cannot produce putrazine, you can see this is the green bar is the control. This is the PI. Uh, in wild type, there was growth promotion, but here there is absolutely no growth promotion in any of the ADC mutants. However, I can, uh, I can, you know, reconstitute this phenotype if I add putrazine externally. Because if you remember, what is the difference between this ADC and the wild type plant is the level of putrazine. So if I add it externally to the media, I can get a growth promotion telling us this is, you know, um, a host induced putrazine, which is very critical also for uh, uh, in Arabidopsis to uh, to promote growth, which tells us putrazine is required for P. indica mediated growth induction and the phenotype of ADC mutants can be rescued by exogenous uh, putrazine treatment. This is uh, the model that we propose. <clears throat> so essentially, uh, the, with the respect to the metabolite, the, uh, it's, the feeling is mutual. Mm -hmm. That means it's good for both. Increased host putrazine biosynthesis promotes both plant and endophyte growth. So if you look at this whole model from A, so this here is P indica. So and here is the putrazine produced by the roots. Now <clears throat> this um, um, this putrazine is produced via the arginine decarboxylase or the ADC pathway in plants. Uh, and this putrazine enhanced putrazine in the roots is responsible for activating the levels of IA and GA, which in turn leads to plant growth promotion. This putrazine is also good for the fungi because it promotes fungal uh, growth and uh, hence it is being used both by the host and the microbe for its advantage. That's what we have listed here. A, P. indica alters host metabolism, including ADC1 expression resulting in increased Putrazine biosynthesis in the host. Putrazine increases the growth of P. indica and is required for robust colonization. And it increases the abundance of plant hormones I A and G A, leading to plant growth promotion in the roots. So um, this work was published in Plant Physiology last year. Um, and now what we are trying to look is, um, uh, you know, we, we believe that diverse microbes can use this pathway or uh, putrazine mediated pathway to promote growth. We are now essentially looking at the growth defense trade off during the tritrophic interaction between tomato, P. indica, and Spodoptera litura. We are trying to look if P. indica is able to give it an induced systemic resistance against Spodoptera litura. This is uh, one of the projects going on in the lab. We can look up at this uh, paper for further details about how we came up at this metabolite. Essentially, we have done a lot of statistics to reach. With this, I come to the end of my talk. So this is my group in NIPGR. We are a very large group of uh, students coming from all over India. Come, They come through the CSAR. You have to qualify for CSAR. And we only take PhD students and postdocs at NIPGR. They're registered at JNU. So essentially, all good students from all over the country come 
you can also as an msc student can also apply as an intern uh, to the lab if you want to work for one year or six months for on your msc dissert dissertation we can take two students in a year so this is also possible we have excellent postdocs. This work is essentially the work of my postdoc, Anish Kundu. Uh, he's a CSAR postdoc. He was helped by Abhimanyu, who's an MK Bhan postdoctoral fellow in the lab. Preeta is a PhD, was a postdoc also in the lab, and Shruti is a PhD student. We, were, we are funded by the Department of Biotechnology, the ICR to the NASF grant, EMBO, and Serve Power. With this, I want to thank you for your attention. And I would be happy to take any questions. So all the measurements, metabolite measurements that we've done is in-house. We have a very good metabolomics. Uh, you know, I don't think I have put up a slide of it, but no, I don't have that slide. Uh, so we have a very good metabolomics facility at NIPGR where we can measure all everything that I've just described to you before. And it's open to use for everyone. You can go to the uh, you type on Google metabolomics NIPGR. It's open for external users as well. Uh, and it's payment basis for everyone for both internal and external users. Yeah. With this, I want to thank you for inviting me for this talk and giving me the opportunity to present one of our works. And I'll be happy to take questions if you have. So uh, you wrote about potassium biosynthesis. So all the uh, works that is uh, when you are identifying the biosynthesis or the effect on the plants, you've done a lot of uh, metabolomics work. My doubt is that in general, if I'm taking an uh, isolate, uh, like uh, maybe I'm not yet identified the genus or species, I'm wanting to know about whether uh, that micro has an effect on potassium. So uh, basic. On a basic level, what can I do to whether to know whether it has any production of potassium or any that we might say this without going for a high, higher metabolomic area? Just look at the expression of the um, biosynthetic genes of in the host. You know, at least if you're taking, for example, tomato, you know, already know that there are these five genes very few number of genes. You can do a real time PCR after your microbe colonization and look up whether these are, you can see at a gene expression level first that they are induced. Yeah. But these biosynthetic genes should be known in your system. Now, if you're taking some crop where there, nothing is known about putrazine biosynthesis, then you will have to first do bioinformatic analysis, look at the AD, because the arginine and ornithine pathway is conserved across plants. So this is the only two methods by which they can produce putrazine. So you will have to look for this ADC and ODC genes, their expression in the first case before you do anything. And it's the easiest to do. So in case I have to see my particular isolate of micro has any effect by that. So mm -hmm. uh, in that case also, uh, I'm asking in that case, what kind of genes I have to look for or what kind of... It, it's the same genes, you know, the, the biosynthetic <laughs> gene doesn't change with the microbe, right? So you are you will check with whatever microbe you're talking about after a specific day time point which you have to choose wisely. So we have you chosen a time point 40 dpi, which was that is the time point we see maximum growth promotion. Okay, uh, so you, you imagine you use a little bit late time point and you can do a real time PCR to check the expression of these genes upon n number of microbes you can test. Good evening, thank you for your lecture. As we all know, Putrazin is like uh, is also involved in uh, some of the decomposition process, which is also a product of uh, metabolite of uh, decomposition of some of the biological items. So, in your case, here it is promoting the growth of the plants. Uh, yep. Is the metabolite uh, activity is based on the relative uh, space or time? Like in the plants, you said it is uh, inducing growth. And uh, in some cases, it, it was found that it was also involved in apoptosis as well as in disassembly of biofilm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're correct. It's very uh, temporal and spatial uh, process. It is happening in the roots, and uh, only as, at a very low concentration, it's able to promote growth. So too much of putrazine is not good for the plant. If you overexpress this putrazine biosynthetic gene using a 35 as promoter, the plant will not grow bigger. So you need a fine balance of this metabolite at this very low concentration when the root and the fungi are coming together, then it is, you know, acting at, as a stimulant for both. This is what I want to tell you. So it is it is only one of the metabolite in this whole symbiotic process. We have only looked at 40 dpi. There may, might be multiple other metabolites. If I look at, 
you know 30 dpi or 10 dpi where i don't even see a growth promotion but they have formed a contact yeah at this stage maybe i get some other metabolites as well this is something we have to look but with respect to putrazine it's really concentration dependent and at a low concentration it seems to be good for both host and microbe is it good for the colonization by bacteria uh, because it is found to be involved in some cases yeah yeah so yeah yeah all there are multiple reports of uh, be it being involved in you know rhizobacterial yeah. interactions but i don't see any functional studies you know you can tell uh, you when i have a bacteria hundreds of metabolites can change it doesn't until you prove that functionally by knocking out a gene you cannot tell its essential its role um, without you know you have to do a functional analysis to find a, a specific role of a metabolite so this is missing with the, uh, the bacterial studies that i've seen they have reported that it's high but nothing else after that and they have more of this conjugated form so comaril putrazine uh, they don't they are not reporting the pure uh, the primary metabolite there so any students if you have doubts you can also feel free to write to me i'd be happy to answer your questions if you have any um, but also ranjit also from you you have a lot of metabolites so you can have 50 stories from it <laughs> you know when you go deeper into it and try when you try to do functional essay you um, sitting on a trove of data which has to be proved further yeah. unfortunately in maize we can't do weeks you know you have to raise the stable transgenic line so this is one disadvantage in maize Does uh, TNAU have a maze transformation um, facility? I mean, protocol set up. Is anybody able to raise uh, transgenic plants in maize? Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, maize is very tough crop. So now to, to, you know, do any functional studies in maize, we need to have to be able to manipulate them and be able to transform them. So I don't know. I mean, with maize, what is what is the established ones in TNA? Okay. Good evening. Uh, I'm working in AHL compounds in uh, groundnut rhizobium. In many papers, AHLs also promote uh, growth or uh, it is quantified as 10 micromolar. Whether 10 micromolar is the uh, same rule for all metabolites? No, 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 no. That you have to test for each metabolite. You know, it, it just has to be tested with my, the, your own system. Uh, what is the concentration that works best in your hands? Why we, why we tested this also very critically is that we know that putrazine, too much of putrazine is not good for plant growth. So that's why we tested all these low amounts as well. Yeah. But you have to test for each of your system. There is no such <clears throat> specific concentration that I can tell that is uh, functional for every metabolite. But for us, it's very easy to test because, you know, this grows axinically. So for us, it was relatively easy to test this. Whether we can do quantification in GCMS or only LCMS, if we have quantification. So we did both. So my first untargeted was GCMS because at that time I didn't have LCMS uh, in the institute. But untargeted analysis, I feel GCMS is better. Yeah, because GCMS, you have a very good NIST library. You have a database by which you can annotate these metabolites very well. In LCMS, the problem is, or Orbitrap, for example, if you use any of these systems, you will get a lot of mass features, but you cannot annotate them uh, very efficiently. So you might get 20,000 mass features in an LCMS, but you annotate only 5% of it. So the annotation is still a huge problem in untargeted LCMS. So I, what we did is we first did GC, identified the metabolite, and then made a method to quantify it in LCMS by targeted quantification to be very sure about this increase in the root. 
So uh, we did both the approach. We used an untargeted GC and an LCMS just for targeted. So you can also use that. You have to use it because for weeks you have to show that your plant really doesn't have that metabolite. So you can't always go running to GC. The GC also has a disadvantage in that we get mostly primary metabolites. We sometimes miss many secondary metabolites in GC. So this is one disadvantage. But yeah, with LC, the problem is annotation. Uh, what are the uh, how many standards or uh, what is the concentration of the standard we used uh, in GCMS or LCMS? Uh, I think we ran a standard curve for LCMS for putrazine. Like you quantify any other by external calibration curve, we would have run a standard curve and uh, quantified it um, uh, for putrazine. For GC untargeted, I think we just use a ribitol uh, as a kind of for a you know, approximate quantification in the beginning. We always validate it with the targeted lid. Okay, thank you for the clarification. On behalf of the uh, university, I don't know what I'm going to say, university and department of religion microbiologists, now I'm going to say this. I previously thank uh, Dr. Jodi Lakshmi, what I say, for giving a very good uh, um, talk on plant microbe interaction. And most of our MSc and PhD students are uh, working on plant microbe interactions only. And okay. uh, yeah, we have very good facility of uh, GCMS, LCMS, and all these okay. things. Okay. Okay. Uh, most okay. of them are working on it. As you said, uh, like uh, in the GC uh, thesis itself, we have uh, worked many metabolites. Uh, and from your talk, uh, we could get a clear picture how to proceed further. And we have to find out the dominant one. Uh, Thank you. Bye.